After the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, life rose back up pretty quickly. Within a few million years of the KPG mass extinction, mammals, birds, and reptiles took on many of the niches left open by the fall of the Saurians. This resulted in many huge and bizarre forms. One of the first mammal groups to get big resembled modern rhinos, but were quite a ways removed from them genetically. These were the Dinosauratans, and some of the first ideas on how they looked and lived are totally far out. As much as I talk about the Bone Wars, E.D. Cope, O.C. Marsh, and their contributions to dinosaur science, the whole period, and everyone working during it, were also instrumental to the understanding of biodiversity between the end of the Mesozoic to today. One of the first major scientific showdowns of the Bone Wars was about the bizarre four to six horned, saber toothed, rhino like mammals from the beginning of the Cenozoic era Uintetherium and Company. You may be thinking that the first case of scientist versus scientist was putting the Elasmosaurus's head on its tail, but that didn't occur directly in the literature. Uintetherium belongs to a family all its own, the Uintetheriidae. They belong to the larger group Dinosaurata. The exact position of this group has been a working conversation since the days of Cope, Marsh, and Lighty. The Dinosauratans show a lot of characteristics that you see in modern ungulate mammals, but the group appeared so early on in mammal evolution and have such a mishmash of characteristics overall that they don't really comfortably fit into the ungulate clade as it's known today. The ungulate clade being the one that contains horses, tapirs, rhinos, camels, pigs, antelopes, deer, hippos, whales, bovine, goats, and more. They've been variously allied with a few different groups of mammals over the years. Othniel Charles Marsh didn't like competition, so when Edward Drinker Cope encroached on the work of describing and classifying the Uintetheer type mammals, Marsh was quick to list off any and all corrections to mistakes poor Cope made. In some of the first descriptions of Cope's Uintetheers, specifically Loxolophodon, he made the mistake of thinking they were proboscideans or elephants. To be fair, Marsh also kept referring these creatures to the Perisodactyl order, which is the one that contains rhinos, tapirs, and horses. To be even fairer, because neither are correct, the bones of these beasts do look a lot like elephants or rhinos. It's all thanks to convergent evolution, baby. Some later researchers have even compared them ecologically, though not genetically, to hippos. This whole situation of describing the bones of the Dinosauratans or Uintetheers and trying to figure out what they were got even more complex when O.C. Marsh, E.D. Cope, and the third Bone Wars scientist Joseph Lighty were all naming and describing more critters of the same type. Eobacillus and Loxolophodon were Copes, Uintetherium and Uintamastrix were Lighties and Dinoceros, Titanotherium, and Tynoceros were marshes. Some of these have been sunk into Uintetherium, and some still remain, but it was really just a big old cluster f <laughs> Despite the venomous retorts of Marsh, Cope's ideas of elephantine Uintetheres went a bit further than just the scientific literature. But before I get into the social media interpretations of the time, I want to talk about how he thought they were elephantine. The snout and nose area of the Uintetheer skull is what's scientifically called excavated and extosed. Look inside the nose, there's a big ass hole, and some spikes and pitted plates or sheets of bone in there. Cope figured this was the internal base where muscles for a trunk attached, like what you see with the huge hole in the forehead of elephants or tapers. Cope compared the teeth of Uintetheers to those of Dinotherium, which is the infamous chin tusked elephant. Unfortunately for Cope, any similarity is due to convergent evolution. Whatever the truth of the matter is now, Cope figured the four to six rounded bony crests or horns sticking out of the top of the Uintetheer's skulls were the base for antler-like projections that extended over the skull. Some of this had to be somewhat speculative based on only a few similarities Cope had found between the Uintetheers and the elephants. This is certainly an interesting take on these creatures compared to what I, and probably you, are familiar with. 
I'm used to the ugly multicolored plastic toys of these guys that come in bags of little plastic dinosaurs. I even tried looking them up and uh, apparently they were made by some company called Jaru. I had the little orange one. Turns out this reconstruction ain't that realistic either, go figure. Cope's reconstruction is an example of how a single analysis of fossils can paint how a good number of future reconstructions will be done. However, it's also an example of how easily they can be shot down and taken out of circulation through the paleontological zeitgeist, a feat more easily accomplished during the late 1800s when most people weren't reading dinosaur books or learning about life of the past. Just make sure you're not being overly influenced by other artists to reconstruct the critter you're reconstructing the way you're reconstructing it. I could totally see Copes Uintetheres as real animals though. Those antlers would be a great way to signal sexual prowess and health to females, or it could be used to defend against the early carnivorans that could have inflicted nasty cuts and slices to smaller individuals. I don't know why an animal would have both tusks and antlers when tusks and antlers are usually both used for sexual selection, but thus goes the anachronistic inaccuracy of this reconstruction. The trunk, even a small taper-like one, would have been especially useful in bringing leaves and fruits to the mouth, and for stripping branches of their foliage. The large ears would have helped the big beasts cool down as they lowered their hefty rumps into the cool swamps and rivers of Eocene, Wyoming. Imagine the noises this version could have made. Alas, it was not to be. This interpretation of the Uintetheres first appeared in a Pennsylvanian monthly article written by E.D. Cope about his Eobacillus discoveries. This one gives the critters four horns with twines like deer antlers and a long trunk. Authors and illustrators William and Mary Gunning took Cope's hypotheses and ran with them in their book Life History of Our Planet, published in 1881. Their illustrations show their uintetheres with two moose or elk-like antlers sprouting from the bony horns at the back of the skull, and two pairs of sharp pointy horns off the two protrusions over the eyes and nose. They also gave the critters a cute little taper trunk. The rest of their anatomy is clearly based on elephants, as they have thicker columnar limbs and a long tail, ending in a long tuft of bristles. The illustration is replete with a variety of animals around during the late Eocene of Wyoming. Since they were clearly trying to show readers the variety of critters alive at the time, and not the true biodiversity, I won't give them any sh** for putting so many beasts so close together. The Gunnings also had a stylized skeletal diagram of the Uintetheer in their book, showing us where the antlers and horns attached. Someone would go on to illustrate a Uintetheer in a slightly different way. This illustration is marked with Jobin Blanadet, so I'm going to assume some arrangement of those names is the artist. Disregarding the disgusting watermark, you'll see it was given three pairs of backwards curving horns attached to the bony bases. Certainly not impossible, but just as improbable as the others. Though little is still known about the exact appearance of these bizarre mammals, it's pretty certain they didn't look like these early attempts. There isn't much in the bones that suggests a trunk or huge elaborate crests attaching to the rounded ossicone-like horns. They likely appeared something like a cross between a rhino and an elephant, but could have been a whole lot different considering how unrelated they were to both of those lineages. Although this reconstruction has fallen by the wayside for the much more realistic, logical, and widely accepted one of today, it is fascinating to see where paleontology has advanced since the time of Cope's Uintetherium. Make sure you leave a like and comment on this video, share it around and subscribe. While you're at it, ring the notification bell too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Want to help Edge out? Subscribe to the Patreon at any tier you like for a whole smorgasbord of delicious offerings. Many thanks to Thea Svensson, Steve Bradshaw, Staniforth Hopkins, Natty Cat, Dinosaur, Arda Bayer, Abby Smith, Henry Brennan, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron. You've all helped to make this channel possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you.